consequences of the sort of anti-Muslim misinformation campaigns, it's really dangerous, uh, certainly for uh, Muslims, and it's even deadly, I would say, at times. This includes, you know, attacks on mosques, like this mosque that I'm with, the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. It includes hate crimes and threats to individual Muslim women, children, and families. I personally know folks who have been directly threatened, who have faced attacks, and sadly, even have had family members killed. And I myself, I've had people drive by, roll down their windows, and yell obscenities at me, tell me to go home, even if I'm a mile away from my home. You know, this is very real. And the impact of this kind of bigotry, it includes, as Reverend Terry mentioned, uh, the impact on precious Muslim youth and students facing bullying in schools, even at the hands of their teachers and school administrators at times. It includes the discrimination at the work and in the public places. Uh, it includes family separation, surveillance of mosques, and so much more. But this kind of anti-Muslim bigotry, it doesn't just have an impact on Muslims. It actually impacts all of us as Americans. It affects every single American who cares about freedom and democracy, civility and decency, because again, that misinformation campaign that's been promoted in our country attacks our shared American values like religious freedom. And it threatens all of our civil rights because it's driven by fear. And research shows us that fear makes us more willing to give up our liberties and our freedoms in the name of, quote, national security, end quote. In fact, that very same argument about national security was used against our Japanese American sisters and brothers as we put them in concentration camps during World War II and later regretted that horrible action as a nation. And beyond that, Islamophobia makes us all less safe in at least two ways. First, it provides recruiting material for violent criminals and cults out there. And second, it takes resources away from the actual criminals, the actual sources of threat in our country. We saw the deadly consequences of that with the Parkland, Florida mass attack on Valentine's Day, where law enforcement had received multiple reports about the suspect in the school shooting, but did not act. We see it in the almost exclusive focus on Muslims or people of color, which allowed for the attempted insurgency on January 6th and the threat of white nationalist groups to grow in our country and actually pose a risk to all of us as Americans. Bottom line, we need to have evidence-based investigations, which are more effective at keeping us all safe, not generalized prejudice based on faith or race, which is what Islamophobia is. And Islamophobia also opens the door to other forms of bigotry because bigotry and discrimination, they're like a fire in a house. They can destroy and bring down the entire house. So it's not surprising that this misinformation propaganda campaign against Muslims has also led to non-Muslims facing attacks like our Sikh American siblings or Indian Americans or even a Catholic American black man who was shot in the face next to a Walmart in Florida. And the person who shot him asked, are you Middle Eastern and are you Muslim? Before firing a gas powered pellet gun at point blank range. That criminal, he later told police that he didn't care that his victim wasn't Muslim saying they're all the same. And we've also seen white Christian men who are also direct victims of anti-Muslim bigotry with our Portland heroes who were attacked on the MAX train. The survivor, Micah, he's now a friend of mine. I've actually met with him and his family, along with the family of Talishan, one of the other victims, one of the victims who was actually killed in that horrible MAX train attack in Portland. I've shared in their grief and witness that pain directly. And it breaks my heart to see and experience these kinds of unnecessary losses of life. So Islamophobia, this sort of anti-Muslim bigotry, it's an issue that affects all of us as Americans, as human beings, something we should all care about. And the impact on people themselves 
when they are filled with the kind of hate and fear that's promoted by the anti-Muslim industry is something else, something profound in and of itself. This is actually me at the Act for America, the largest anti-Muslim hate group in our country, held a series of rallies, anti-Muslim rallies across our country. Uh, and this one was one at Seattle. Um, and I remember uh, going to this uh, rally and actually putting up a Ask a Muslim sign and having people come to me and ask questions. And this couple uh, showed up, the woman in the wheelchair, she actually had a sign on her lap that was an anti-Muslim sign. Um, and, and she was, she and her husband were saying all kinds of, you know, some of the, again, the myths and misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. And I remember talking to her and there was a point at which I ended up holding her hand and just speaking with her with care and compassion because my faith gives me the strength to be able to do that. And we're having this moment and a Reuters uh, a photographer happened to be there and they captured this moment. I didn't know they were doing that, but it was, well, what really hit me is how much that hate and fear hurts individuals who have that in them. And I've seen this also in the roadshow. We did a series of roadshow events, Reverend Terry and I. We went to cities across the state of Washington, smaller rural towns where we talked to people and talked about sort of what's happening with this industry and this misinformation campaign. And, and I remember our first one uh, that we went to uh, and we didn't know what to expect. And we showed up in a small town, uh, not knowing who's going to be there. And we actually had far more people than we expected showing up, which was a great sign. And afterwards, I had two separate people come up to me, admit that they had been sort of holding anti-Muslim hate and fear, and that that was really affecting them themselves. And just that two-hour session that we had together, that that really uplifted them and that transformed them. And that they even sh were, were shedding some tears because they couldn't believe how much they had bought in to the lies and the misinformation. And we hugged and it was just beautiful. And again, redemptive even in having those kinds of moments and seeing that kind of transformative impact that relationships and actual real knowledge and information about communities that are disparaged or marginalized, the kind of impact that that can have. And finally, I want to say that it's important to recognize that Islamophobia is really a continuation of the same narrative of fear, scapegoating, and otherization that is used against other minority communities here at home and abroad. The narrative and the script, they're very similar. All you got to do is change some of the characters and the labels. This is how the, the T word terrorist gets used the same way that another T word thug has been used in a different script, for instance, to demonize, criminalize, and terrorize entire communities. And really, ultimately, it's a tool to divide we the people, because we in fact have a lot in common as Americans, even if it doesn't always seem that way in a very divided country. And I will close by saying that as bad as things may seem at times, it is still an amazing time to be alive. And we cannot and will not let the haters or the hate prevail. I am so proud to be an American Muslim woman at this point in time, because never in my lifetime have I felt that we collectively have more power than we do today to make a real difference. Never in my lifetime have our collective words and actions been more critical in determining the future of our country. We, all of us, you and I here on this call and out in the world, we are writing history right now with our words and our actions or inactions. We each have the incredible opportunity and the potential to make a real difference in the future soul and direction of our country. And we have a choice. We have a choice to make, to either remove the hate and fear and pursue a narrative of facts over, to, to remove that hate and fear and be able to actually pursue a narrative of facts over fiction, love over hate and faith over fear in order to create a more perfect union and a country and a community where we are all better off as one nation under God, 
indivisible with liberty and justice for all.